This Rise and Shine podcast series has been made possible by the generosity of the Zeitelman Family Foundation, which is committed to the unity and continuity of the Jewish people through meaningful and relevant Jewish education and wisdom. We don't sweep away the broken shards of that which caused us hurt or pain or damage, but rather we use those fragments as reminders. We hold on till we can find the blessing, even within the sorrow and the loss. This is Rise and Shine, a podcast that offers timeless wisdom and uplifting meditations to fill your heart, feed your soul, and start your day on a positive note. Here is Adrian Gold Davis. Life is filled with moments of extraordinary beauty and profound bleakness. If you live long enough, you know this to be true. I often think that maturity is being able to sit in the many shades of gray that the human psyche and condition has while continuing to thrive. But I believe that one of the hardest things that a human being can do is simultaneously hold both the broken and the whole in the arc of one's heart. Why am I using the term arc? Well, here's the biblical backstory to that reference. As always, our Instruction for Living manual, the Torah, gives us concepts and framings that serve us today as they did thousands of years ago. This concept is particularly powerful. We read that when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, carrying the Luchot, the tablets that contained the Ten Commandments, engraved for us by our Creator, he saw the children of Israel dancing around an idol that we'd made with our own hands. You see, the people thought Moses had abandoned them because he didn't come back when they thought he was meant to. And they reverted back to pagan ways, searching for a new leader, even if it was made of gold, melted from their jewelry and shaped to look like a golden calf. So when Moses saw this, he smashed those tablets to the ground where they shattered into pieces. He then went back up the mountain to beg forgiveness for his people and returned 40 days later on what became Yom Kippur, our Day of Atonement, with a second set of tablets. And they were our forgiveness, our second chance to get it right. Now, it's important to know that while traveling through the desert on the way to Israel, there was a traveling sanctuary called the Mishkan. We'd built it collectively. It was our place, metaphysically, of God on earth, the manifestation of the heavens. And in the center of that sanctuary was the ark, gold on the inside and golden on the outside, that contained those tablets holding the Ten Commandments. But not just the re-engraved whole version that Moses brought to us on Yom Kippur, but also the shattered fragments of the original set as well. They were not discarded, but rather they were kept side by side with the whole recreated ones. So what's the life message in this? Let's tease that out a bit. When the Torah commands the children of Israel to build this sanctuary, this Mishkan in the desert, there's an interesting grammatical anomaly which begs a little investigation. God tells them to build a sanctuary so he might dwell within them. Now, shouldn't it say dwell within it? What does this linguistical quirk teach us? Our sages teach us that God dwells within each of us. In the arcs of our own hearts, there is our Creator, and there will be that which is broken and that which is whole. There will be a place even within the broken that can serve as a reminder, a placeholder, so we might understand that things can be both broken and whole that we don't sweep away the broken shards of that which caused us hurt or pain or damage, but rather we use those fragments as reminders, as jumping off points. We don't sweep under the rug. We hold on till we can find the blessing, even within the sorrow and the loss. So how is it possible to be so emotionally flexible, to be able to endure sometimes 
quick and even unexpected transitions between joy and sorrow, disappointment and elation. You know, studies have taught us that resilience and balance require that we be able to hold a full menu of differing feelings and be able to give ourselves permission to move within that range. This autumn, on my trip to Israel at wartime, I came face to face with this dynamic as I watched Israeli mothers vacillate between crying and dancing, weeping and laughing. You know they say that Israel is the fourth happiest country in the world after Finland, Denmark, and Iceland. Is there a relationship between resilience and happiness? Israel, we know, is besieged with surrounding enemies. They are attacked and fired upon, and when they defend themselves, they are vilified and ostracized. We are indigenous to this land, but they call us colonizers. Everyone does mandatory army service or public service before college. There are far fewer than six degrees of separation in that country. Everyone knows someone who has fallen in service, in terror attacks, in brutal circumstances. So why is it the fourth happiest place on earth? Well, leaving aside the glorious weather and the beyond comparison culinary food scene, the beaches and the mountains and the forests and the deserts and the birds that fill the air with song, besides the desert that blooms like an oasis thanks to the farmers who work that land with love, and besides the high-tech sector that has gifted the world everything from the ultimate GPS system we call Waze and Google Map, and invented drip irrigation systems and miniature cameras that you ingest, for internal medical explorations, aside from the desalination systems that we pioneered and the medical advances we've gifted the world, aside from all of that, Israel lives in the reality that life can be both broken and whole at the same time. That clarity and maturity, that living in reality, I believe that's what makes Israelis not Teflon, because things don't just bounce off them, but rather makes them constantly mindful of the power of every second. And whether the people of the land of Israel are deeply secular or deeply religious, they recognize the sanctity of the land that they live upon, and they live lives of purpose, meaning, and action. Taking responsibility. You know, it's been said that Judaism is not a religion of rights, but rather one of obligations. Apparently, taking responsibility, taking action and understanding that we have obligations creates a resiliency, a maturity, a mindfulness that leads to happiness. Is it possible that in an attempt to make our kids happy, we've stripped them of the resiliency that comes from falling and failing and facing reality, of finding true happiness? This week, can you examine your relationship between inspiration and perspiration? Are you moving through your life, surfing the waves of the inevitable ups and downs of the human condition, or are you just getting out of the water to avoid those waves? Are your children so unconsciously allergic to struggle that they can't get back on that surfboard and keep surfing? It's worth examining because through peacetime or wartime, Israel stands resolute, whether broken or whole, and sometimes both at the same time. And isn't that what we want for our children? Thanks for listening to Rise and Shine. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to Momentum Podcasts on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Join Adrian again next time for more timeless wisdom and uplifting meditations that fill your heart, feed your soul, and start your day on a positive note. This podcast was sponsored by the Zeitelman Family Foundation. Spread the wisdom. 
inspire Jewish individuals around the globe by supporting Momentum's podcasts. To sponsor, contact podcast at MomentumUnlimited.org. You're listening to a Momentum podcast. For unlimited inspiration, wisdom, and empowerment, visit MomentumUnlimited.org.